Thank you, Candace. Um, so we have had the current social care system for, as Candace said, 70 years. But it's 20 years since the Royal Commission published, almost exactly actually, 20 years since the Royal Commission published this report calling for a wholesale change to the social care system of delivery and funding. Now, whilst that triggered some change in Scotland with the introduction of free personal care, unfortunately in England, it gained little traction. And so what we've seen over the last two decades is a succession of reports and reviews, inquiries, even some legislation. Um, this is just a sample, but no actual real proper reform. And now here we are in 2019, awaiting a green paper, uh, promised nearly two years ago, but I'm told it's, it's soon. Um, so while, we, while we've been waiting for that green paper, which, on which now a lot of hopes are pinned, we've been looking to other countries to see what they've been doing in this area. And as Sir Andrew very eloquently put uh, this morning, we're not alone in, in facing the challenges that we do around our ageing population. At the moment, about 5% of our population is over 80. That's going to increase to 8% by 2040. But when you look at Japan, they're already there. They're 20 years ahead of us in terms of the, the demographics, and Germany is hot on their heels. So by looking abroad, we can almost look into our future to see how these countries are dealing with their, their future, their, their care needs. And of course, it's not about the, the, just the older population. Adult social care is just as important, but I think the demographics and the change in our population help to set this in the context and give us a sense of the scale and the urgency of the challenge. And of course, the, our demographics don't just dictate and determine the level of need that we have, but they also have implications for how we fund that care. And this diagram just shows the old age dependency ratio. So at the moment in the UK, for every 10 working age adults, there are around three people over 65. That's going to increase to around five. So one in, for every two people in work, there'll be one person over 65. Japan, again, is already there. By 2050, for every 10 people in their work of working age, there'll be nearly eight people over 65. So these are really quite stark uh, demographics and challenges that we face. So while we're not alone in the challenges that we face, we are in a small minority of developed nations that haven't, hasn't properly grappled with the issue of social care and reformed our social care system. So we've been looking at two that have managed to do this. And Germany and Japan present quite interesting examples, not just because of their demographics, because of the way that they have approached reform. So over the next 15 minutes or so, I'm going to present four or five main lessons I think we can, we can learn from these two systems. And it's important, obviously, to acknowledge there are contextual differences. And I don't want to... Um, I don't want to present these as perfect systems, but I think that we can learn from their imperfections as well as their successes. So I have about 15 minutes to set out two incredibly complex systems, um, which, so apologies to the nations of Germany and Japan for uh, reducing huge nuance and detail um, into a set of slides. So, so as we've talked about already this morning, this, in this country, we find it very difficult to gain political and public support for radical reform, as evidenced by this succession of different papers. Um, and what we've seen in, over the, the last two decades is that social care proposals for reform have been set out largely at, at election time, when there's very little incentive for politicians to collaborate and work across parties. It's quickly turned into a very politically divisive conversation. And that's not helped by low public awareness of how the system works. I think the LGA survey last autumn uh, indicated that around is it 40 or 50% of people still think that social care is funded by the NHS, it's part of the NHS. So it comes as a big surprise to people that it's not. So it's very difficult, I think, to have that debate with the public with that low level of understanding. But Germany and Japan started from a, a similar point. It's not a dissimilar story, actually. And one of the surprising things from our trips abroad is that their discussions took a long time as well. So Germany started talking about reform to their care system in 1975. And the 1980s saw the publication of a succession of reports and inquiries and reviews. Sounds familiar. Um, it wasn't until 1995 that they managed to enact reform. 
Similarly, in Japan, pressure from, from the aging population grew over the 1980s and put pressure on the health service. But reform there didn't happen until 2000. So maybe that gives us hope, I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, but the, I think a, a difference between where Germany and Japan were when they enacted reform where we are, is that there was widespread pre public pressure for change. So there was a, a good understanding of the problems in the system. There was widespread discontent at the lack of care and the high costs. And that is what helped um, drive reform. And then once those discussions reached the political sphere, the discussions sought to directly address the issues of concern to the public, went, went with a grain of social change and, and social trends and tried to um, create a system that supported um, and enabled social change. And I think it's interesting to note that in both countries, the window of opportunity came as a result of economic and political upheaval. So in Germany, it came in the, in the form of reunification. And whilst that uh, delivered some economic challenges, it opened up a different political discourse and forced to the, to the fore some of these issues that have been kicked into the long grass. Similarly, in Japan, the economic crash of the 1990s uh, created some political upheavals, and the, therein lay the window of opportunity. Now, I don't know if, our, if Brexit is our opportunity. Uh, it doesn't, doesn't feel like it right now, but you, you never know. So by the point, by the point um, in time that real reform was on the table, people were convinced that change needed to happen. Um, and the, the discussion was how to solve it, not if to solve it. And I don't think we're quite there yet. Now, I don't need to tell anybody in this room about the challenges of, of social care funding, so I won't. Um, but I, I pulled out this quote from one of our interviews um, in Germany. And the, the interviewee was saying, well, why have you come to Germany to learn? What can you learn from us? We, you have the NHS. So we explained our social care system, and this is her response of, of total surprise. Um, I think it echoes some of the things that Sir Andrew was saying. I always thought that Britain was not that poor, but you're telling me there's no way of taking care of something which is not an exception but the average. Either you've got money or bad luck. And I think that quite clearly sums up the situation. So what have Germany and Japan done in this area? Well, they're, they're, they've got slightly different systems, but they both have similar principles. So they're both about collective funding. Everybody pays in to a central national fund. In Japan, it's from the age of 40. In Germany, it's once you start employment after the age of, of 23. Now, they're both based on social insurance systems. So Germany has a pure social insurance system, by which I mean those contributions are paid into a, a specific fund, which is administered by a, an arm's length but publicly owned body. And the government has very, very few powers over that pot of money. They can't put money in, they can't top it up, they can't divert funds. So there's a transparency there. It does make it quite inflexible, though. So Japan, when they were designing their system, wanted a bit more flexibility. So they chose to fund it partly by social insurance for that transparency that it gives the public, but also half from taxation, so they have a bit more flexibility. There's also a clarity in, in these funding models. So contributions are a fixed percentage of income, and people pay in every month. It comes off your, your pay slip, and that burden is shared with your employer 50-50. And the, the contribution rates are around 25 to 3%. Um, and retired people continue to pay in. So with that recognition that the wealth actually in the older population is increasing, um, they pay in the, the full percentage out of their pension. So that's an attempt to address that intergenerational fairness. Now, one of the other issues I think we have in the English social care system is a deep sense of unfairness in that eligibility and access to services and funding varies quite widely depending on where you live. Um, and the prices that you can pay as a self-funder also vary quite widely. And, and I think that gives a sense that the, the system's well, it's very confusing for people trying to navigate it, but it's also quite deeply unfair. So both Germany and Japan have taken a, a, the same approach to this. They've created a national framework for eligibility and benefits. So it doesn't matter where you live. You can live in, in Berlin or Dusseldorf. You go through the same process of, of eligibility. And that, through that process, you're assigned a care level. In Germany, it's one to five. In Japan, it's one to seven. And that consistency gives a, a, a nice clarity uh, to the system. Now, that care level that you are uh, assigned when you need care is associated with a fixed monthly budget for care. So it doesn't matter where in the country you live. 
in both countries, you get that the same monthly sum that you can spend on your care. So there's a nice clarity there. And just for clarity, that monthly budget is for care needs only. So if you're in a residential or nursing home, there is an extra fee, hotel costs, which is for, for board and, and food, which I think is similar to the, the Scottish system. But the, the two systems diverge slightly here, and I think it's, it's interesting to just reflect on some of the detail here for our own thinking. So in Japan, benefits are given in kind only. There is no cash in the Japanese system. And that was a very deliberate decision by the government because they wanted to shift the care burden from families onto wider society. And there was already trends with the breakdown of the, the traditional family. But because of its stark demographics, they also needed to release more women into the workforce. So there was a very deliberate decision there to, to keep it in kind. I'll come back to, to the challenges that, that that poses. In Germany, it's slightly different. You can choose to take your benefits in cash or in kind or as a mix. Now, care is not free at the point of use in Japan. When you, you access care, you pay between 10 to 30% of the care costs, and that's means tested. Um, but importantly, that monthly fee that you pay is capped at a certain level. So even if you're at the highest care level and in a very intensive care setting, even if you're, you're paying 10% of those care costs, that will be capped at a certain monthly level. So you're not penalised for having higher care needs. And importantly, that system is consistent with the health system. So in Japan, people are used to accessing healthcare and paying a co-payment of around 10 to 20% for healthcare. Now, they're slightly different in Germany. So the benefit, the system was set up to cover basic costs, so to ensure that everybody had access to basic care. But there's, so it was intended to cover around half of care costs, so people were expected to top up the other half. Now, there's no cap on that. So whilst the, care, the costs of care have risen over the last 25 years, the benefits have not increased in line. So people are now facing quite high costs, which is leading to some discontent. And it almost feels like they've come full circle to a point where people are, are facing unacceptably high costs. The other point about the German system that I think is important for us to note is that it's not consistent with its health service. So whilst the German health system is free at the point of use, its care system is not, and that comes as a surprise to people. And one piece of advice that, that policymakers that we spoke to and politicians said, if they could give us one piece of advice, it would be to make it consistent with your health service so that people understand that and it helps to, to, to gain that public buy-in. One of the other key problems in the English care market is, at the moment is instability, with care providers handing back contracts and going, going out of business because of the downward pressure on fees. And obviously that has a huge impact on, on care users. And so Germany and Japan have, have faced this issue and created a national fee schedule in order to create a stable and, and competitive market. So it's a bit like the tariff in the NHS. So if you're a provider, you know for every, in Japan it's, it's rigidly set every three years, every three years you know how much you're going to be paid per individual at care level one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So there's a certainty there, you can do planning and you, um, it's adjusted slightly for, for staffing levels as well. But it gives people, uh, providers a certainty and it has created a very stable and competitive market in both countries. It also allows the government to incentivize certain types of care that it might want to encourage. So Japan basically had no care market before 2000 and it really wanted to encourage entrance into the home and community care market. So it has increased the fees for those types of care and decreased residential care fees. And so there's, a, there's an inbuilt mechanism there at the centre to, con to control costs. Now, the fifth and final lesson um, is the, the most difficult one, uh, which is why I left it for last. Um, we're going to be hearing later from Candace about workforce challenges. Um, so I won't go into too much detail here, and everyone in the room will be familiar with the challenges that we face with high numbers of vacancies and high turnover. And in the, the care care market, low pay and status. Um, so Germany and Japan face the same issues. This is the number one problem that they face. 
Um, it by far eclipses any concern they have about financial sustainability of, of their systems. Every single person we spoke to said it's about the workforce. So we're not alone in, in this. But unfortunately, they don't have the answer either. Um, but they did have some advice for us. Um, the main bit of advice was to make workforce an integral part of funding and, and service delivery for reform from the outset. And I think sometimes we have a tendency to focus just on the, fun, the funding model without thinking about actually how are we going to deliver the system, who do we need to deliver it, and what are the implications of that for, for funding. Because it's, and it's not just about pay, it's about conditions and status too. Now both Germany and Japan are looking to recruit from abroad, that is a central strand of their strategy uh, for trying to fill some of the workforce uh, challenges. So we need to be mindful that we will be competing for the same staff. Um, and whilst those countries are making their immigration uh, systems more flexible and welcoming, we seem to be going in the opposite direction. Um, and I noticed that a, a news story today of a German hospital has placed an, argue, um, an advert in Guardian Society for nurses, for Polish nurses specifically, inviting them to come back to live in a European country. So we need to be mindful that we are going to be competing in the same pool uh, uh, of people. And then lastly on this, I just want to sound a note of caution about technology and, and being realistic. And we've heard this morning about the, the potential of, of technology, but also th that we need to be, a re be realistic. Um, it has its place in delivering a more efficient system. But I think we need to be cautious that caring is a people-intensive business, and there's no two ways about that. And I'm often asked, oh, you know, when I said I've been to Japan to visit nursing homes, they said, well, everyone look, is looked after by robots, right? Um, I didn't see one robot. And when we asked about robots, we got blank looks. And then we Googled a picture of a robot, and we got a blank look. And, we, and the answer was, we don't want to be looked after by robots. All of our policies are about reducing isolation. This is, you know, this is not part of our strategy. I just wanted to bust that myth. Um, but I think a common theme in both countries is, uh, is an acceptance that the reality is that we don't have enough professionals. We, we're not going to have enough professionals to meet care needs. So we need to think creatively about how we, we sustain the care system. And the two countries are taking slightly different approaches to this. So Japan is focused on harnessing the, the power of communities and really investing in, in volunteering. And they have a, a vision to create communities where people are able to live independently, so even people with dementia. And I think that reflects some of the comments this morning about dementia-friendly communities that, that we were hearing about. And there's a huge focus on prevention and keeping people well and independent and reducing isolation. So whenever we asked about the sustainability of the, of the system, the answer was always, it's about prevention. That's the central strand of, of the policy. In Germany, it's slightly different. So there is a, a clarity of expectation that the family will play a big role in, in delivering care. Um, that's well understood, it's well accepted. It's a, it's a very um, well ingrained German <coughs> value about the, the centrality of the family. And the system was set up in order to facilitate that. So the, the decision to include cash in the system was deliberately to, to help people look, look after their, their relatives. Um, so at the moment in Germany, about 70% of people receiving benefits choose to take cash. Um, so that goes into informal care. And we were told by policymakers that a main policy in Germany at, the mo Germany at the moment is to keep that level at 70%, because if it drops below 70%, th the system gets into, into difficulty quite quickly. So there's a big focus on caring for the carers, making care easier to do by joining up policy across employment and families and communities. And they're, they're trialling a certain uh, a number of policies around flexible working, unpaid leave, and, and interest-free loans to help people do that. So I'm often asked, would the German or J Japanese system work here? And the answer is, mm, uh, maybe, probably not. I think we need to be cautious about dragging and dropping a system from a different context into our own. Uh, because I think care, possibly more than anything, needs to be embedded in the, the culture and the social values and the trends that, that we have. But I think some of the principles from other countries um, could work. So I think fairness, I think fairness has to be at the heart of the system. By that I mean an ability to spread the, the risk of catastrophic costs across society so that they don't just fall 
on individuals. And I think there's a transparency in the German and Jap Japanese system which has helped to build support and understanding of, of how it works. And that sense of consistency with national eligibility uh, and, and benefits has really helped to, to gain and, and maintain that public understanding and support. I think there's a, a, a urgent need for stability in the provider market here, and I'd be interested to hear about reflections on whether a, some sort of national fee schedule might work in our context. But lastly, we need to think long term. We need to, if we have this opportunity for reform, which hopefully we, we, we have now or will have, we need to think about a system that will work now and inject money into the system now, but also work in 2040, 2050, when those population uh, demographic pressures really bite. And we need to think holistically. So it's not just about the money. It's not just about the funding model. It's about the whole delivery of the system and the workforce and how, how, it's, how we're going to deliver services to meet needs. But I think the first challenge we need to overcome is building a political consensus and public awareness and public support for change so that we can have a real debate about what system we really want and need, what we're willing to pay for it, and how we make that happen. And hopefully, the Green Paper will provide a starting point for that debate. Thank you.